Well, good morning, Waypoint Church. We are so glad that you are here. If you're joining us online, welcome. If you're joining us from Iola, glad you're here. Let's worship the Lord together.
of the goodness of God.
church, would you pray with me for just a moment? Father, this morning, we recognize that it has nothing to do with us. It is Christ in us. We want you to have all the glory this morning, God. May our worship be a sweet fragrance to you as we continue by opening up your word. My prayer, Lord, is that our hearts would be turned towards you and that as the spirit moves, we would grapple with what it means to submit fully to Jesus Christ. We love you. We worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. If you would go ahead and grab a seat. This is a time in our service every week where we do not end worship, um, but we stop the musical part and we move on to something else, and that's giving. There's a lot of things that happen throughout this building, throughout this campus, and then outside of these walls um, in all sorts of parts of the world. And that is fueled by the generosity of our people, and you guys have always been amazing at that. So this is a time in our service where we give. If you'll get out your tablet or your phone, you can go to waypoint.info in any browser, and it will pull up kind of our digital bulletin. And in there, you'll see a section for notes here in a moment when Pastor Scott comes up. Um, you can take notes and then email them to yourself. There's announcements in there. But there's also a tab in there that says giving. So I want to encourage you to take the next few moments, and let's give generously back to God's kingdom. Morning, church. Hey, real quick off the top, we're going to start with first things first. How many of you maybe snuck in here early and got one of the few printed notes? Ha <laughs> uh -huh. Want to let you know up front today that this is good to be a paper airplane, or maybe in light of the Super Bowl, you can fold it up in one of those triangles and uh, but just wanted to let you know up front, uh, Pastor Matt Hess, if you want to hear this sermon, you might just have to go to Wentzville. Uh, Pastor Matt was originally going to preach today, and uh, his mother's been battling a severe illness uh, for some time now, and uh, things took a turn, and he is headed, and he is a, he headed on Friday afternoon to be with her in Kansas, and he's there now um, doing exactly what you would pray a child to do in a mother's last days. And so just remember to lift him up. Uh, it, I think it happened quick enough that his, the rest of his family is here worshiping with us this morning. Um, but originally, on Friday, I said, hey, email me over your notes. I'll, I'll try to pick it up. We're gonna move forward in Genesis 26. And man, I trust the Spirit. I'll just preach your sermon. And then he emailed me his notes, and he had seven points. And I said, no. <laughs> so I wrote my own. So, man, it's Super Bowl Sunday, though, right? And so I thought, hey, man, what, what better way to kick off this morning uh, than to talk commercials? Uh, how many of you are old enough to remember back in year 2000, there was this commercial from a, a local St. Louis beverage distributor, to be unnamed, that uh, starts off in the desert with this police officer pulling over a bus, and bus door opens, and he walks up, and the police officer moves his shades. He goes, ah, oh, looky here. We got ourselves a celebrity. And behind the wheel of the bus is Tim McGraw, right? And I know there's a couple ways to make enemies real fast. You talk sports, or you talk about country music, right? So we're going to do both. <laughs> the idea of this commercial is Tim McGraw is dri driving the bus. The police officer says, look at this. We got ourselves a celebrity. And his next line, he goes, you're Tug McGraw's kid. And for those who don't know, Tim McGraw's dad is actually a former Major League Baseball pitcher, left-handed reliever, I think multiple-time World Series champion, who in his own right had made a bit of a name for himself in his generation, uh, but obviously eclipsed by a son who's won three Grammys, been nominated over 20 times, and sold 57 million records. And, and the, it's a funny commercial. It actually ends as Tug pops his head out from behind the bus. They get out, and it ends with the police officer with his radar gun clocking a 60-something-year-old Tug McGraw's pitch to see if he still got it. <laughs> but there's something to be said, isn't there, about fathers and sons, about the legacy of a father to a son. If you've been around youth sports culture anytime recently, I know you've seen this especially if you've ever volunteered to coach, as I know several of you do, because your problem athletes usually are your problem 
parents. Can I get an amen? There's a reason they say the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree because whether it be in mannerisms, whether it be in personality, whether it be in physical appearance, or maybe on a day like the Super Bowl, you know, there's a lot of people wearing their gear today. Maybe you're a huge Chiefs or 49ers fan because your dad was a huge Chiefs or 49ers fan. But there are so many things that we pass on like father, like son. And that's the title of our message today, Like Father, Like Son, because what we've arrived at in Genesis 26, if you remember last week when we went through 25, is the passing of the torch from one generation to the next. And together as a church, we considered what does it look like to steward the next generation well, to steward the resources and the responsibility of pouring into and raising up the next generation, all the while knowing that God always provides the next leader, God always purposes his will in his providence to accomplish for his glory exactly what he wants to do. Yet it doesn't resolve ourselves of our responsibility of being obedient to care for and to steward and to pour in to the next generation. And when we arrive at Genesis 26, we're gonna read the whole chapter, and so it's another long narrative. There's no names this time that are gonna be as difficult, maybe one, uh, but it is a long narrative. And so like, buckle in and, and click in because this is the story and the chapter of the longest peak into the life of Isaac of the entire scriptures. And it's very interesting when you think about Isaac because looking back from the New Testament on this part of Genesis, you know, God is referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Patriarchs of the faith, the original covenant promise to have a people for God's own possession to Abraham, his son Isaac, Jacob. But Isaac has been often referred to throughout Christian history as the ordinary son of a great Abraham and the ordinary father of a great Jacob. Because as you read the narrative of Genesis, this is like a flyby chapter of most of what we know about Isaac's entire life. But I think a lot of it will be familiar to you. Because like father, like son, there are so many similarities between the experiences of what Isaac goes through in chapter 26 and things that we've already read about his now deceased father, Abraham. So let's read this together, see what jumps out in familiarity. Starting in verse one, it says, now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all of these lands and I will confirm the oath that I swore to your father, Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and I will give them all of these lands. And through your offspring, all the nations of earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and he did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister, because he was afraid to say that she is my wife. He thought that the men of this place might kill him on the account of Rebekah, because she is beautiful. When Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah. So Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, she is really your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? Isaac answered him, because I thought I might lose my wife on account of her. Then Abimelech said, what is this that you have done to us? One of, my, one of the men might well have slept with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech gave orders to all of the people, anyone who harms this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Isaac planted crops in the land and that same year he reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his, father, that his father's servant had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar, where he, uh, where he settled. Isaac 
reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. And he gave them the same names that his father had given them. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the, herd, the herders of Gerar quarreled with those of Isaac and said, this water is ours. So he named it Essek because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also. So he named it Sitna. He moved from there and he dug another well and no one quarreled over it. So he named it Rehoboth, saying, the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in the land. For there he went up to Beersheba. That night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Isaac built an altar there and he called it and he called on the name of the Lord. There he, placed, uh, there he pitched his tents, and there his servants dug a well. Meanwhile, Abimelech had come to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, his personal advisor, and let's be honest, here's the name for this chapter. It looks like fecal, which to me, <laughs> we're just gonna call this commander Captain Poopy Pants. <laughs> so he came with his personal advisor and fecal, the commander of his forces, and Isaac asked them, why have you come to me since you were hostile to me and sent me away? They answered, we saw clearly that the Lord was with you. So we said, there ought to be a sworn agreement between us, between us and you. Let us make a treaty with you that you will, not do, that you will do us no harm, just as we did not harm you, but we treated you well and sent you away peacefully. And now you are blessed by the Lord. Isaac then made a feast for them, and he ate, and then they ate and they drank. And early the next morning, the men swore an oath to each other. Then Isaac sent them on their way, and they went away peacefully. That day, Isaac's servants came out and told him about the well that they had dug. They said, we have found water. He called it Sheba, for to this day, the name of that town has been Beersheba. It's a long narrative. It's a long story of the life of Isaac. But I'm telling you, if you have been paying attention over the past several months as we read about the life of Abraham, are you catching the similarities of their experience? I mean, both of them experienced a famine. They both were confronted by foreign kings. They both, in fear, lied about the nature of their relationship to their spouse for their own safety. Both Isaac and Abraham's wives were barren, if you remember. Both of them are then blessed with children. They're both made the head of the covenant, the oath from God for his people. And over and over throughout 26, we were being pointed back to everything that was true of God and true of the promise to Abraham is now being passed on to Isaac. And even in his very experiences and in the opposition he faces and walks in his life, there's shades of how his father handled the same situations. I mean, do you remember this when, when on behalf of, of his family member Lot, Abraham went to war against foreign kings, but here we see Isaac dealing with them peacefully, right? There's a lot of similarities, there's some differences, and really the questions that I want to address with you this morning, of all the things we could talk about, the theological truths of the promise and God's faithfulness to his covenant, and all the amazing connections we could make to Abraham, to Isaac, and then even to the new covenant, and what this means for us, there are weeks and weeks of deep, rich truth in a text this long. But I practically want you to ask a question this morning. In the context of facing opposition, how are we to live as the people of God? I think through the life of Isaac and in chapter 26, we're gonna find at least three truths that describe the nature and the reality of the opposition that we will face as the people of God. And I want to offer you some encouragements for how we are to respond in light of that truth. So like father, like son, Isaac faced and we face, the first thing I want you to see is opposition. We face opposition from the environment. 
Now, I use the word environment both in its literal sense that some of what we're actually gonna talk about is the physical earth that we live on and its produce, the, the environment around us. But this is far more than that. I'm talking about our circumstances, our situations, the culture around us, the economy, the laws that we live under, things that are outside of our control that make up the context of the life that we live as those who are trying to pursue Jesus at Waypoint Church as a 21st century Westerner. We're gonna face opposition in that context, in this environment. And in this text, in the very first verse, we see that in a very literal sense, Isaac faced opposition in a famine. There was a famine in the land. You put yourself all the way back in the times of Genesis, before the invention of the Industrial Revolution and the modern agriculture, you know, the technology that we have in modern agriculture, a famine was life or death of the highest degree. This was significant opposition. But if you saw at the beginning, it said, this isn't the same famine that Abraham faced. It was calling out that famines were something that happened more routinely in this season, obviously without the technology. Uh, The weather patterns, the very nature, the environment of the natural order of a decaying created world often caused there to be shortage of natural resources. This even takes place in the context of a desert. That's why the wells become such an important picture. But what's the larger spiritual truth here, right? Okay, there's a famine in the land. Is that just a detail that's like in first grade when you're teaching a, you know, a young kid to say, what's the setting of the story, right? Is this just the setting like we're in the desert during a famine? Or is there something we're supposed to take from that? I wanna fast forward to the New Testament. I wanna remind you of something as we begin to talk about the opposition that we face. And the first thing is I want you to see in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, that, that the scripture says, beloved, and that is just addressing us. That is the church, beloved. Those who are of the household of God, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Can we just pause for a moment and be honest and say that as we relate to our environment around us, is it not more common for us to talk about it in terms of our own distance, our absence from reality, as if everything that's happening around us is just so strange? Like, can you believe what just happened? Can you believe the stock market or that law? Oh my gosh, the St. Louis weather, right? It's this removed kind of ethereal idea that like things are just happening out there that are so surprising all the time and I just can't believe that there's resistance and opposition in my life and how frustrating is this? The reality of a biblical worldview, someone who knows the scripture and has taken to heart the expectation of what it means to follow Jesus in a broken world on this side of the fall in Genesis 3 shouldn't be surprised that there's opposition from the natural order of a created world that is subject to to sin. I mean, all the way from Genesis chapter three, one of the very natures of the curse wasn't just that sin entered into the human experience, but that all of creation would be corrupted. And one of the very curses that's called out all the way back in that original narrative is that from the toil and hard work now to work the ground, the land, the earth, the environment are gonna be thorns and thistles. It's gonna be difficult. You're gonna sweat. You're gonna prick your finger. It's not going to be easy. The world is going, the earth is going to oppose you. It's gonna resist you. It's gonna be difficult. Have you ever connected the dot that you fast forward to the cross of Jesus and as we as humanity represented by Adam reached for a tree, he was hung on a tree. As he grabbed fruit with his hand, Jesus' hands were pierced. And ultimately, the curse of the thorns and the thistles was placed upon his head. That Jesus wasn't just embodying death to sin, although he absolutely was, and that is a spiritual reality for those who are in Christ, that we are free because of the blood of Jesus that has forgiven us our sins, but he's reversing the curse of everything we read about in Genesis. For the futility and the hostility that the world has, the way that it opposes in its decay and in its devolution, Jesus reverses that curse, and he promises us that behold, one day, he is making all things new. 
So Isaac, like his father, encountered a famine. He encountered opposition from the natural world. If you don't believe me from an Old Testament narrative, if it feels like we're cherry picking something really finite or small, let's listen to the New Testament. Romans 8, 18 through 22 says, uh, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So here's the reality. Since the fall in Genesis, the entire creative order has been corrupted. The extent of the curse of sin has grasped far beyond your personal life to the entire environment around you. And it's a both and, both your personal sin and, and your life, your decisions and your flesh, and the context of the world around you will provide opposition to a life of righteousness, holiness, pursuing Jesus Christ. We shouldn't be surprised by that. That's the true story of the Bible. Now, here's what's amazing. If we're connecting the dots of everything we've read up to this point in Genesis and specifically chapter 25 and what comes out on the other side of 26 is that even all of this, what seems like chaos and decay of a broken and dying world is still under the hand of a God who has providence that he works even these difficult, hard, oppressive things out for his good and for his glory. Do you remember the last point of last week's sermon is that he purposes his will? That no matter what it looks like, the sovereignty of God is comprehensive. Nothing in all of creation exists outside of God's power and God's control. And for that, we should be both humble and hopeful. And it's no different in this text. When the context of the world around you seems to oppose a life of holiness, when it puts hurdles in your path, when it changes what you expected to see, know that God is still a God of providence, that he works what the enemy meant for evil, for good. I also wanna read for you from Isaiah chapter 40, a text that you're probably familiar with, but I'm not sure if we've ever connected it to the idea of opposition. But Isaiah 40, 28 through 31 says, have you not known have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength and they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Not just the economy and the culture and the laws and the weather and all of the natural order around you, but even your own finite weariness and exhaustion of a human body that's subject to curse and decay is part of the opposition that you're gonna face in this life. I mean, right now, Pastor Bob's battling bronchitis and can't be with us this morning, right? Pastor Matt is with his mom as she is you know, coming towards the end of her numbered days that God had given to her. These are very tangible examples of what it looks like to live a life pursuing Jesus with the opposition of the curse of sin that affects our everyday life. You will face opposition from your environment. And so the question that we need to be asking then is how do we respond? Well, Isaiah chapter 40 gives us a beautiful encouragement. When we face opposition from our environment, we should trust and wait on the Lord because he's sovereign, because he's the one who works all things together for your good and for his glory. And because of that, we should wait and trust on the Lord. The economy, the weather, the laws, those in authority, all of those things change. The seasons turn, life happens in seasons, it's not static, but God's everlasting. He is unsearchable. It's in him we should trust, and it's on him we should wait. Don't be surprised, you will face opposition from the environment. The second thing is that you will face opposition from the inside. 
You will face opposition from the inside. It is far easier for us to talk about everything that's wrong with the world, that the world's decaying, and that disease is rampant, and that culture is shifting, and that these leaders aren't trustworthy, and can you believe the weather this week versus last week? And it's easy for us to detach and try to create some proximity and distance between what we believe is our responsibility and maybe the created order. But I also want you to know that opposition that you will face in your pursuit of Jesus actually comes from the inside. We see this in Isaac's story as he stays in the land of Gerar for some time as he's traveled there. He's already interacted with King Abimelech, but Abimelech looks out the window and recognizes that he's been lied to, that because Isaac feared what might happen to him, within his own heart, he chose to misrepresent the truth and he sought comfort and safety over truth and obedience. And he said, this isn't my wife, this is my sister just like his father. And and certainly in that moment, it might be something that you and I would be prone to do is say, well, the devil made me do it. It was was external forces. But what if they would have? And we begin to make these excuses and these self-justifications, but church, we need to have a good theology of sin. What is sin? Where does it come from? Yes, because one man sinned Adam, sin entered into the whole world, and we have inherited a sin nature. But don't distance yourself because that theological truth is so grand as if you don't have personal responsibility in the matter. Matthew 15, 19 says it like this, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. Now, that's not a definite list of all the things that come out of the heart. Those are the sins that have root in the heart. It's a, it's a representative list saying all forms of evil, all sorts of gratifying the self, all sorts of pursuing your own interests instead of pursuing Christ come from your own heart. Has Jesus set us free from that? Absolutely. But we live between the already and the not yet. Jesus has already forgiven us of that sin. Jesus has already provided us with the resurrection power of his spirit living in our life to defeat sin. But we are not yet glorified. We are not yet perfected. And we still battle and war against our own heart, our own desires. Lest you think I'm cherry picking one verse. James 1, 14 through 15 says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to what? Sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. You will face opposition from the inside because the curse of Genesis chapter three is not just an ancient text or a spiritual reality to be known. It's a battle you fight. You have a flesh and you can choose to feed the flesh or feed the spirit. You can choose to walk in obedience or you can choose to misrepresent the truth as Isaac did for your own personal gain, for your own safety, for your own accomplishments or whatever it is that has captured your heart, power, control, acceptance. What's your idol? What's your God? Are you living for Jesus or are you living for yourself? Colossians chapter three, first Verse five then tells us how we should respond. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Don't miss that. It's the shortest word in this text, in. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Again, a representative list, giving the counterpoint to the other list we just read. That sin is in you and from your heart comes all sorts of evils. Yet you through the power of the spirit because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his gift to you of grace and the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you now can counteract, can go to war against and can put to death all sorts of types of evils in your life. And you can live a holy and righteous life in pursuit of Jesus Christ. So, So here's the answer, here's the question, right? When we face opposition from the inside, we should go to war and put to death our sin. Does that define the way that you live your life? 
Is evil to you just something that exists out there? Or do you recognize your own propensity to commit evil, to choose yourself over others, to even put others in a vulnerable position to protect yourself? It's in us. We have to go to war against it. And war is messy. There's no such thing as a war that's clean. There's no such thing as a war that feels good. If you're going to put to death the sin that's in your life, you're gonna have to get dirty. My question for you is, have you devised a battle plan? Have you immersed yourself in the community of the church to come around you and encourage you to pursue righteousness? Do you have accountability in your life where you've given people permission and proximity to speak in so that when you begin to veer off course, you have people who are there to nudge you back in the way of the Lord? Have you pre-decided to choose to do what's right? Do you have a path of escape to flee temptation to that thing that has you ensnared, to that sin that you've been battling for weeks and months and years? We have to go to war against our sin, and it's not easy, and there are times where we win battles and we lose battles, but in the end, God has promised us the war's already been won, so fight with hope, but fight with passion, because when you face opposition from the inside, we need to go to war against sin. So you're gonna face opposition from the environment. We're gonna face opposition from the inside. And the third thing that I want you to see in this text is that we faced opposition. We do face opposition from the enemy. We face opposition from the enemy. This is both the enemy, namely the devil himself, and the enemy, those who walk among the earth with us who don't live for Christ, who are of the kingdom of Satan, and they are doing his work unknowingly. Their eyes are veiled to spiritual things. They don't even know that the king of their kingdom is the devil. John 10, 10 says it plainly, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. It's the kingdom of the world. But Jesus says, I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. We can live in the freedom of the people who can put these things to death because we have a victorious king but we also have a very real enemy. What did this look like in our text this morning as we read through Genesis 26? Well, Isaac goes to King Abimelech, right? And Abimelech does not follow Yahweh. He doesn't know God in an intimate way. He ultimately recognizes that the hand of God is much more powerful than his earthly authority and that whatever's going on in Isaac's world, we're in the midst of a famine where life and death is of the matter. His crop is a hundredfold. Abimelech notices that. And even in God's providence, through his earthly authority, he's the one who provides protection for God's people. I mean, do you understand how amazing that is? That Isaac the representative of God's covenant for God's people, chooses fear over obedience, lies about who his wife is for safety. It's the secular king that calls him out for his sin and in response to the sin of Isaac says, if anybody touches you or your wife, I'm gonna put him to death. God uses the heart of a king and stirs it like a river however he so wills. That's the kind of God we serve, a God that's so strong, that's so powerful, that he uses earthly authorities, even those who don't follow him, to purpose his will, to accomplish his purposes. We have a very real enemy, and we will face opposition from the enemy. And Isaac did this, not just by having to interact with what maybe in the beginning of the conversation felt like a hostile authority and eventually kicked him out of the land. But we see this throughout the whole narrative as they begin to try to open up these wells that were dug in his father Abraham's day. And there's a lot of cultural context surrounding this, but in the context of a desert, wells are also life and death. Literally, the definition of a desert is a lack of water. And so when you dig a well in an area like Gerar, that well is sustenance for life. And oftentimes in this culture, when you wanted to drive an enemy away from your territory, the very thing you would do is you would go and you would throw earth, you would back up the U-Haul to the well and you'd dump dirt in it and you would stop up the well because you're cutting off their very life source. 
And there's a, there's, there's a lot we can take from this about the historicity of this text, that this isn't just a narrative and this isn't just to, an allegory to make a story, that this really happened because this is exactly how they would have done it. You don't throw trash down it because then you contaminate the water source and your people can never use it. If you're trying to get rid of your enemy, you wanna fill it with earth that then you can excavate later so that you get the clean water, right? And so that's what happens here is they are pushing him out of the land that's already been promised to him. And so when it looks like all hope is lost, what we saw his father do, go to war against foreign kings, Isaac chooses grace and peace. You know, there's a text in the scripture that says, as long as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, there's an admission in that very text that it doesn't always depend on you. There will be times where you face opposition from the enemy, where there is no resolution or solution offered on the table. Two parties won't come together and agree, and there is just outright resistance and opposition and even attack. And in those cases, we see Paul evoking his own Roman citizenship and his rights for the sake of the kingdom of God. And it's okay for us as Christians not to become doormats. We're not just the nice guys that get walked over by the rest of the world, but we are those who understand that because we've been shown much mercy, we can show much mercy. And as long as it depends on you, when you have the opportunity, live at peace with everyone. And that's what Isaac models for us here. That's what, that's what he chooses is that even though it was his herdsmen and his servants who dug the wells and it was just and right that they were his father Abraham's before and he had done the work and he had invested the resources to get them working again, they were taken from him by someone who wanted to profit from his labor and his people. But he listens to the Lord. He lives at peace. He moves on and he trusts and the Lord. We're gonna face opposition from the enemy. So how do we live in that context? Philippians 1, 27 and 28 encourages us like this. Only let your manner be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, serving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. What are we to do? We're to stand firm. And we're not just to stand firm in what we believe, but we're not to be frightened. We're not to be surprised by the attacks of the enemy. We're to stand firm in them. And God promises that what he'll do in that is he will use it to your enemy as a sign of their coming judgment, destruction, and of your ultimate salvation. And that's exactly what happens in this passage. What does Abimelech finally see is that God multiplies everything that Isaac puts into the ground during a famine. He has a hundredfold and then he sees him peaceably giving up that which isn't his and he comes to him and he says, listen, will you just sign a treaty so that you don't oust us because it's obvious that the hand of the Lord is on you and whatever power you're living in is something far greater than my kingdom has ever possessed. And God comes through victorious through mercy and through grace. It's a powerful weapon. It's not a doormat. Meekness and boldness coexist in the kingdom of God. How are we to live in the opposition of enemies? We're to stand firm. Luke chapter 6, 27 through 28 also tells us this. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. That's not easy. That's something that can only be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. To do good to those who wanna do bad to you, to in the face of those who mistreat you and abuse you, to pray for their good? Are you kidding me? Only someone who understands the gospel, who understands that that's exactly what Christ did for you when you were his enemy, could ever turn around and offer that to someone else. And that's what we see Isaac doing here is although he was being unjustly and unfairly treated, he did good. He signed the oath. He didn't have to do that. They had mistreated him, but he vows, I'm not, I'm not coming for you. I'm not here for your destruction. I'm here to follow God. Romans 12, 20 says it this way. To the contrary meaning different than the way that the whole world would do it. 
given the same circumstances, when opposition faces the world, there's a way that the world responds, eye for an eye, tit for tat. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. What does that mean, that you'll heap burning coals on his head? Ultimately, what it means is just as in the story of Isaac, who gets the glory when we respond with the character of God when we face opposition? Jesus. And that's what it's all about. It's not about earning or proving our position. It's not even about earning God's favor by our performance. Don't you find it amazing that in this very text, God confirms the promise, the oath with Abraham to Isaac. And he says, because your father Abraham followed my commandments. It should make us pause and say, wait a second, we just read all of that. Abraham did, Abraham failed a lot. Even the things that the Bible speaks of in terms of you earning, you earned them through the power of the Lord by grace. Abraham wasn't perfect. Abraham didn't perfectly fulfill his side of the covenant. He had a God who was gracious and a God who promised him that he would be God to his people. And even when Abraham and Isaac and you are faithless, God remains faithful. And it's what's so amazing about the new covenant that we've been adopted into is that God promises that he will fulfill that and be your God forever. So that when we face opposition from the environment, we can wait and trust in the Lord. When we face opposition from within, we can put our sin to death and go to war against iniquity. And when we face opposition We know that our trust is in him, that he's faithful. When that opposition comes from the enemy, we can stand firm and do good. We can trade our famines, our fears, and our fighting for what God gives. He gives provision, he gives protection. And both in this passage and as an eternal inheritance to his church, he gives us a place, a place to call our own, a place for his people forever with Jesus. We're gonna face opposition, but we've been called on as God's people to remember God's faithfulness to his covenant, God's faithfulness to his church, God's faithfulness to his people. And one of the ways that he has asked us to remember that is by regularly gathering together around his table when you walked in, you probably received elements this morning for us to observe the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. I don't know when the last time you read the scripture text surrounding this meal that Jesus had with his disciples, but in the book of Matthew chapter 26, it says, now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he says, take, eat, this is my body. What does the bread represent? It represents the body of Jesus that was shredded, it was torn for you to make reconciliation. And so this morning, as we're gathered together as a church, if you are one who follows Jesus, you've placed your faith in him, repented of your sin, you've been baptized, I wanna invite you to participate by remembering the Lord's faithfulness to be our God, that he was our sacrifice. You don't have to be a member of Waypoint Church, but you do need to follow Jesus. And so if that's not you today, take this opportunity to just pray that the Lord would reveal to you the opposition, the sinfulness, the brokenness of the world, and how he could be your savior. If you follow Jesus as a remembrance of who he is and what he did for you, take and eat. It says, and he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Listen, we just spent weeks, and we're gonna continue talking about God's faithfulness to his promise, to his covenant, to his people. As we partake of this today, 
Would this be a reminder that this just isn't, this isn't ancient literature of something that happened one time, although it did? This is the very beginning, the genesis of the story that we're living today, that there's a new covenant in the blood of Jesus, the full fulfillment of all of his promises of the Old Testament for you, and that we've been grafted and adopted as children of the promise by faith in Jesus. Take and drink. The only proper way to respond to the grace of God in the midst of opposition is to just worship. And so I'm just gonna quickly pray and that's what we're gonna do. Father, would you receive our worship to you as from those who understand that we're broken, that we need a savior, but that we've been redeemed. And because of that, we don't have to live in the identity of our flesh. We don't have to claim the nature of a sinner, but Father, you've given us freedom. You're making all things new, our environment You're making us a new creation from the inside out and you've already defeated our enemy. It's in your son Jesus' name we can boldly proclaim those things, amen. Amen.
church. Just want to remind you that as we prepare to close down our service today, that if you're facing opposition in your life and you just know that either you need to repent and turn and pursue Jesus for the first time, or you just need some encouragement, that this altar will be open. We'll have pastors and care mentors who would love to pray with you. There's a few things I do want to share with you as we leave. And if I could ask you to just grab a seat for just a second. Two quick announcements. Number one, there was a video that we put out this week, and I hope maybe you had an opportunity to see it on our social channels. Just kind of giving you an update of what to expect in the coming weeks as the construction phase of our AV installation commences. And you probably already saw in the lobby today that we have some curtained off, some construction equipment, some lifts out there, because they're getting ready to roll with that starting tomorrow. But what it really means for you specifically is that next weekend is an event that we call the weekend, the WKND here at the church. It's the largest student event. Yeah. It's the largest student event that we do every year. And with that, this place is slam packed. And we're expecting the 9 a.m. service to be at capacity next week. And on top of that, because of that AV installation, we have to remove some chairs from this room to house some of that equipment, which is even gonna shrink the capacity for just a five, six week period of time. And so just asking in advance that you consider staying in this service specifically next week, because all of our students, all of the volunteers and all of the tech and worship team that have to put on that event will all be worshiping next week at 9 a.m. and it's already gonna be over max capacity. So just keep that in mind and be flexible as we begin to transform this room to be a ministry hub. Uh, also wanna ask that you just pray for the weekend, pray for the students and everyone involved that God would move powerfully as he does year in and year out. It's an amazing time to come around and steward the next generation as we've been talking about. Hey, if you're maybe just on the other side of high school, you're 18 into your 30s, we have a ministry called Young Adult Collective. And I just wanna let you know that part of their monthly rhythm is to have a worship service. And it's on the third Tuesday of the month, which is next Tuesday, uh, February 20th. And it's at 7.07 p.m. All the information is in the announcements tab at waypoint.info. We'd love to see you there. Got one more announcement. I'd like to, for this one, to invite uh, Pastor Kirk Palmer. If you haven't had the opportunity uh, to meet Kirk. Kirk has served as our student pastor for the last seven years. And a few weeks ago, Kirk uh, was able to uh, preach a sermon of passing the torch to the student ministry. Kirk has faithfully served us for seven years and far more than serving our church. Uh, and can I just say that if you don't know student ministry, that seven years represents a span of a student that would have started when Kirk got here in sixth grade all the way through their senior year which is something that is to be cheered and celebrated as a church, that he's given us seven amazing years. Yes. And more than just served for seven years, Kirk has transformed and built a student ministry culture at Waypoint. That's something that our church should be absolutely grateful for. Not only has he invested in the next generation, Kirk has one of the most amazing serving teams of mentors who pour into our students here that you could ever pray for as a church. And he hasn't just poured into the next generation and into volunteers, but he's raising up other pastors on his team who are here to receive that torch and to carry us forward into the next phase and the next season of student ministry. And so uh, Kirk is able, uh, just through God's leading and the passing of this torch, he's accepted a position in Athens, Georgia, uh, stewarding another fantastic uh, student ministry that has quite honestly, a network and an influence that helps create student ministry culture that kind of seeps out nationwide. And so we're really thrilled for Kirk personally and obviously uh, so sad for Waypoint Church to be able to, to say goodbye in this way. But I'll tell you this, Kirk, I was told the first service, one of the things that speaks loudest about someone is when you can say that you trust him. And not only do we, our staff, me, trust Kirk as a friend, I know that I've trusted you with discipling my own kids in student ministry, and that's just the person Kirk has been, both here at Waypoint and at this family. So for he, Danelle, and the boys, we are so thrilled for what God's calling them to in their next season. Just wanna give him an opportunity to speak to you. Yeah, church, thank you so much for the privilege and the trust of uh, fighting for the next generation. I believe that uh, this church cares about the teenagers and uh, even all the way down to children's. And so thank you so much. Uh, when you took a chance on a 27-year-old from Southwest Missouri, and it's very brave of you, and, um, but I, I can speak for Danelle and I, it has been such an amazing journey, and we're so thankful 
for the leaders that God has brought into the student ministry. They're the backbone of the student ministry. It's uh, oftentimes uh, people give compliments to the team, but they are really the, the backbone of that ministry. And uh, they're on the front lines, boots on the ground. And so I'm super thankful that I got to journey with them. And um, we're for you. We're going to be cheering you guys on all the way down from Athens and uh, enjoying the seven degree, 70 degree weather in January. And so... Listen, it's our cross to bear, and so, um, uh, but we love you guys, and uh, we'll stop by from time to time as our family's up here, but thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. It means the world to me that you've loved us so well, and uh, we love you guys. Yeah, that's amazing. Kirk's going to stay with us through next weekend. Um, obviously, that's the biggest student discipleship weekend of the year. And it says a lot about someone's character when they pass the torch at the peak and not in the valley, when they leave it better than they found it, and when they leave momentum behind them for the next generation. And so that's ours to steward, and it's ours to celebrate. And so those claps, I know, are genuine. They're authentic. Um, this is the definition of bittersweet. But would you take the time maybe in the next week or today after service to find him and let him know what he means personally to you? I know collectively we love Kirk, but I know some of you have personal things to share. Don't forget to do that. It's a great family. We're gonna miss him, and we're excited for what God's doing here and God's doing in Athens because his kingdom will prevail. We love you, Waypoint. We'll see you next week. <laughs>